I think this will be good though. Like, um, I'll tell you guys this. This was Morph was like, oh my god, how did how did you put the my video out on this topic so quickly? And I was like, well, I slept two hours, and he was like, oh, it was really good. He like Morph was really really kind and said some really good words about the video. And I and I want to like publicly say thank you to Morph because that was um, you know, coming from somebody like him that does really really good content that made me feel really good and um he wasn't sure if he wanted to post a video and i was like i want to know what you think about this like a lot of people don't have the ability to like have a conversation with you so hearing your thoughts through your youtube videos is like the only way that we get um yeah get to know what you think right so creator and founder of star citizen chris roberts reflects on slow development discusses upcoming full persistence tech, cancels CitizenCon, expands the development team, and talks about testing server meshing in 2022. Maybe. Oh, and there's a bar citizen somewhere in there too. This and more in today's video. So don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the bell icon if you think I deserve it by the end and you want to see more. So if you guys have been following my channel for a while, you'll know that I don't usually post the news here. But every so often, there's a big chunk of news that I just can't ignore, and this is one of those. Chris Roberts, the founder of Star Citizen, has finally posted his letter from the chairman for the first time in like and two it's years. And so there's long. a lot of juicy information in there that we gotta get through. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try to be as concise as possible and go through each part of the letter How so you guys can be brought up to speed. I'll focus on the minutes. things that I feel are really important. So if I miss anything that you really wanna hear about, definitely read it yourself. I'll post a link down below if you've got time. So the letter kicks off with a year interview where Chris reflects on how COVID-19 had a big effect on CIG's ability to get patches out for Star Citizen in a timely fashion. And you'll know that if you've been following the project that that's really been the case. A lot of these patches have been really late going into super long PTU cycles and leaving a lot of big bugs unresolved. Chris then goes on to say that he's relieved that they're finally returning to the studio in Manchester, Frankfurt, Austin, and Los Angeles, where they can start to have those great spontaneous collaborations that they used to be able to have in the past, where you could walk over to somebody's desk and ask them a question, or have a conversation overheard where somebody has a great idea or a great solution that you didn't think of. And as somebody who works- What's funny is, like, pre-pandemic, we got, like, no gameplay, though, so it's like- I don't know. Was it better this way or was it better the other way? I Works in the creative industry, designing architecture. I can tell you that this is 100% true. Working in person does inspire more creative thought and helps you come up with solutions that you just could not have come up with on your own. So I'm excited to see what they are able to do getting back into an yeah, office it together. Them to he goes more, on to say that 2021, scary. despite the setbacks, was still a really good year as they delivered their first dynamic event, Xenothreat, and introduced stuff like the Bengal and the Javelin Tour, which you guys have probably already seen on my channel. They also introduced big features like medical gameplay, looting, bombing, personal inventory features, and introduced stability improvements that reduced 30Ks by a big factor, and also added in 30k recovery so that if the server goes down, you're able to get your ship and whatever you were shipping back. That was a objection anecdotal. You guys need to stop watching the Amber Heard trial. Seriously. Big Holy win for a shit. lot of us. He then reveals that this has been the best year for Star Citizen ever, which so I think we can all see from the amount of people coming in and from the videos that we keep seeing from big YouTubers. He explains that the rate this year doubled for new users. It's up 50% and that Star Citizen is on track to pass 500 million in funding gross total this year with over 1 million unique logons in 2022 and 4 million <laughs> accounts since the creation of Star Citizen. Chris attributes this success to the fact that Star Citizen has a combination of scale and detail that you just can't get anywhere else. That ability for you to go seamlessly in first person onto a super detailed ship, then up into space to fight pirates or to go visit moons is, is a kind of experience that you can't get anywhere else right now. And I have to 100% agree with him on this. But while he doesn't say it in this particular paragraph, he does talk about later how new players and veterans are returning to play the new events that they're having. And I think that's actually a big factor in why people are sticking around because there's something to stick around for. 
And then finally, in the last half of this first section of his letter, he addresses some of the criticism about Star Citizen's timelines and schedules that they've repeatedly missed. And if you are somebody who follows Star Citizen's development, you've likely heard about this before. Now, he explains that a lot of this comes down to the fact that the original pitch for Star Citizen back with this original Kickstarter was for a much more limited game experience, something more akin to Freelancer where you would fly down on rails to a planet's surface where you would be limited to just a Why landing zone with a few flip screens to interact with the occupants of that area. This is the thing. This is, drives me nuts. Even Chris did. Why is everybody shitting on Freelancer? Why is everybody shitting on, on, uh, on Privateer like they were bad designs? Like, they're, they're, that's the thing that drives me nuts, is, like, like those were bad games. Like, they're like, why would you want Freelancer is essentially what, like, even what Chris said. And it's like, yes, is this, like, way more expansive? If this was, is this, like, way different? Yeah. But I would have already been playing the Freelancer next. I would have already been playing the next Privateer. And who knows? I'd probably already be, like, over it by now. Right? So it goes both ways in that way, but it's just like, why Why are we saying that this is, is a bad thing? Like, yeah, like, Privateer 2, I can't tell you how many times I did, you know the bottom of the map? The, a trade that was done between the two little planets, they were one jump away from each other, I would do it for hours. There was a trade I can go back and forth quickly and make, like, a little bit of money, but it was really fast, and I would make all this money and then you know, uh, make my ship better and stuff. And then I would go and fight the pirates because I was a kid, you know, and I sucked at games and I still do. So I had a hard time with them. It's just like, dude, why? I, I don't get it. I don't get why the expanse of Star Citizen to what it is today is like just considered a blanket good thing. Right? It's It's insane to me. This is a far cry from what they're creating today. There's so many today, bad things Star that have Citizen come out of this. Is much, much more. It's a space sim, a dogfighting sim, a first-person shooter, a trading game, a resource collecting game, a resource management game, an adventure game, a survival game, a social game. It's got a little bit of everything, and that's what's propelled it to such incredible success, both in funding and interest today. Chris explains that a lot of what we love about Star Citizen is what's taking so much time. And I can understand that, and that's why I'm here for the long run. Next up, well, it's towards the end of the letter, I'm going to first talk about CitizenCon. So it's been cancelled this year, and Chris explains this is on account of the fact that COVID isn't really 100% gone yet. There's a lot of uncertainty surrounding whether or not they could I mean, host it, it in person in LA if restrictions return. And so, instead of risking it and spending a ton of time preparing a keynote presentation and switching developers over to creating this keynote, they're going to do a virtual one again this year with no keynote presentation. And I'm okay with this, because they really do need to get Squadron 4 42 out, and I do want to see server meshing this year, and if this helps them do that, I am 100% on board. Let's get this done, guys. I'm excited. The Virtual Citizen Con will feature some bar citizens and some development panels. CIG is hiding f behind COVID? What? You've got to be kidding, right? Like, So if you guys are interested in that, definitely check out the letter. There are more details there. Also, in relation to getting stuff done faster, Chris also talks about how today they're at 780 staff members worldwide, with 130 partners at Turbulent in Montreal who aren't technically part of CIG, but are part of the family. The new office- See, like, most of what I touched on is nothing of what, um, or most of what Morph is touching on is nothing what I- find important. It says that they're building right now in Manchester and in Frankfurt are going to allow them to grow up to 840 this year, which is going to be a big help for Squadron 42 and Star Citizen. So I'm excited to see like, what they're able to pull off because we're already yeah, starting to see the to benefits of big say. additions to the development team, such as the one from Montreal, who've helped put together a lot of the wrecks and the events it that we're starting to experience Chris today. Can't do a keynote. What is wrong with you people? The keynote isn't Chris standing up. And talking about the future of the game. The keynote is a, a demo that the entire dev team has to stop what they're doing to make the demo. What is wrong with you people? They are not doing a demo slowing Star Citizen's development down for a stupid fucking demo. 
It has nothing to do with Chris being scared to stand up and talk about the game. He literally just wrote everything in a 6,000 word essay. What is wrong with you people? My God. They also shared a bunch of really cool renderings of what their new studios are going to look like, which, by the way, are amazing. What do you mean, you people? I would love to- Objection. ...work here, and if you guys are looking for a development job because you're in the industry, be sure- Objection. Stupid. Be sure to check out the recruitment site because they are looking for talented developers worldwide. All right, I've saved the best for last. The reason why you clicked on this video most likely. The road to 4.0 and Pyro, the biggest patch since 3.0. And Chris says as much. This is similar to the jump from 2.6.3 to 3.0 with its eight month development time. He now sees us on a similar path to the road to 4.0 with its massive leap forward. Because it's not the just pineapple. about server meshing, but what the technology the unlocks for CIG to be able to do. We're talking massive amounts of players, big ship battles, the ability to have more star systems, more NPCs flying around the universe, a better tick rate and refresh rate for the servers so we have really responsive AI. Just tons and tons of stuff. The ability to have, for example, player housing. All of these things are really locked behind the ability for them to be able to scale the resources of a server to handle the additional There better be a caveat in load here after what you just and said, Morph. Items. To get there though, he describes one more big step before server meshing, and that's Persistent Entity Streaming, or PES, which is the foundational tech that will be required Obje to- Objects in the narrator is clearly high on copium. Probably not, but the the thing is, and I'll let him get there. Server I'll meshing. let him get there. PES is the there. hardest part of the work that they if need not, to do for server meshing, and has required the greatest we'll amount of there. effort on the part of the engineers. Now, the importance of PES is that it's responsible for recording the state of every single dynamic object you, in Papa. the game, irrelevant of whether or not it's owned or held by a player. This will allow the game to record and understand where objects are left or placed, regardless of whether or not a player is connected to the server or if the server goes down. And in this part of the letter, he gives us a timeline which includes something you may remember called iCache. He explains that iCache was in fact binned because they realized that that technology that they originally planned to use would not be able to keep up with the demand that they needed for creating the universe that they want with the amount of detail that they have. And so they've decided to switch over to something called the Entity Graph. And this is going to enable them to have a much better performing way to record this information quickly and keep the performance of servers as high as possible. He then goes into greater detail explaining how all of it works, and I'm going to try to be as concise as possible here. Basically, there's something called the replication layer, and this is a server network that's responsible for communicating between the entity graph, which is this thing that records the persistence of the universe and our account information. I just feel like I don't, we don't need to know how it works. It just needs to work. I don't give a shit how it works. That's just me, though. These are all the things that while you're playing, are you going to be thinking that about the replication layer and the entity graph and the server mesh and the and the OCS and DCS and I, IBS and and PES and and sharts and shards and turds? You're not going to be thinking about any of this shit. You're just going to be playing. And this is like the the thing that drives and me the nuts about Star Citizen bit, right now, which is the part that we actually experience the game on. That's where we you know fly our ships and see AI. The idea behind this is that the replication layer can be separate from the simulation and doesn't have to rely on the simulation speed. And so its refresh rate can be set at a set amount independent from that sim. This allows for a much more responsive experience for when you drop Some of us are interested in this, Mike. Settle down. K. Okay, thanks. Well, if you were interested in this, you would have already seen this video. You would have already read this stuff because... If you were actually interested, you wouldn't be watching a video from a content creator explaining it to you. You would, if you were actually interested, you would be listening to a video from the actual developer explaining it to you. Object, or you see an object that was left somewhere. And because it's separate from right. the simulation, it can be scaled through many worker nodes working on the same instance, allowing it to scale with the amount of players in a given area or the amount of entities that need to be recorded in a given area. 
Now that you understand how these things work, you can understand- I'm simply stating about what I care about. I don't give a shit what you care about. And that PES, or the Persistent Entity Streaming Service, needs this stuff for it to be able to work. He explains that this was one of the biggest technical hurdles for the engineers to pull off. And you'll notice that I'm saying this as past tense. And that's because, my friends, after 16 months of extremely hard work by 18 engineers, three dedicated QA members, and four producers spread between CIG and Turbulent, the team was able to successfully demonstrate persistent entity streaming with the replication layer and with the entity graph last week in an internal universe update. Here's a quote directly from the letter. Paul Reindell, our director of engineering for online tech, spun up a server, populated the entity graph to its initial state along with the replication layer, which is essentially an in-memory cache for the universe state backend database that exists in the cloud to help make sure read writes to the database do not bottleneck the servers and clients, something I explained earlier, then connected a client, placed down a series of small objects like cans on the surface of Aberdeen. No, I'm simply saying when I say nobody cares about, I mean I don't care about. It's like a, it's a phrase that I think gets like lost in translation sometimes. With like, I think it's like maybe you're not American or something. It's a phrase I say often, but it just means I don't care about. Along with an 890 jump and an anvil arrow, and then he killed the server and the client. The server was then restarted and we did not populate the entity graph as it had been previously seeded in the initial startup and then connected a client warped to Aberdeen and everything was there as he placed it. This was a huge milestone a as the thing, state of maybe. the universe was recorded to the backend database and then when he restarted the server, it just connected to the replication layer which had initialized itself from the database, the entity graph, and continued with the universe at the state he left it. Chris then explains that this is a really big moment for them because it's going to allow them in the coming years to create an experience in gaming that most online games can only dream of. A universe that you can escape to, that's affected by other players' actions, with the state being dynamic, dependent on player action and NPC action. With this in place, server meshing then becomes possible as the replication layer in any graph is the universe state that the clients and servers need for the rewrite of the so universe. Hard, Morph. So now that we know that persistence is on the cusp of being released to us, when can we expect to see it so that we can test it for ourselves? Well, there's. I'm cringing so hard here because I think he skipped. I think if he doesn't get to it here, he skipped over like the, a very key part of the article. A little bit of a catch here. 2022 is going to be a little bit different than previous years. Chris explains that 318 will require a lot longer in Evo. And I, I feel like you can't talk about the stuff that was in Road to 4.0 without saying what I think he missed. Patches before it. And this is something I can completely understand. He explained there's going to be a lot of edge cases and issues that they're going to encounter when they scale this technology to thousands of players. And so we're likely to see a release to live of 318, and that's the patch with salvage and the cargo refactor, in late quarter three this year, in place of where 319 would have been. He believes that the test cycle could be as long as three months for the PTU, and I can understand this given that people are probably going to stress it to its limits. Thankfully, they have some tech in place to try to combat the issues they predict they'll see with something called a density manager, which is going to clean up the objects people are going to inevitably leave around, but we'll just have to see how it plays out. Now keep in mind that because it's going to be in PTU for so long that we're still likely to see a 3.18 PTU release sometime around when it was originally meant to go live. And so we will still have it in our hands, but we won't be able to play in the persistent universe with our persistent account. Personally, I'm okay with this because they really need to nail this technology before it goes to live. Love it's it. really going to affect the way we play the game in a big way. And if it has really big bugs, everyone's going to go into panic mode. Following that, he explains that salvage and the cargo system refactor, which are really big features for this year, are actually designed around this new persistent entity streaming. He says that they are directly reliant on things like wrecks being left behind so that we can salvage them, which will arrive with 318. So it is a little bit of a confirmation here that we will have wrecks left behind from exploded ships. And I gotta say, I'm really happy to hear this because I was a little bit worried given the stuff that they've shown us that it was just going to be mining, but instead of rocks spawning randomly, we have wrecks spawning randomly. It's effectively then the same loop with a little bit of a different look. 
He then goes on to surprise us with the fact that Gen 12 is going to be mostly done and in 318, which will mean great performance. I'm pretty sure that's what it's going to be to start. Like, let's not forget that it's going to be uh, salvaging tier zero. Performance improvements across the board for everybody as it has multi-threaded support and is just a more efficient engine than what we have right now. And it's also something that can work with modern APIs like Vulkan, which will even increase the performance further. But now it's time to talk about the big one, the test for server meshing. Now, the first implementation target is actually going to be static server meshing, where a server is given a defined area to simulate. As soon as it's stable, they will move on to dynamic server meshing, which will allow them to scale the servers depending on load. And this is what's going to allow them to really bring the performance up and to allow a lot more players in a given area. So we're still going to have to see how many players are added in with static server meshing. Man, we Maybe need at the very least it missions will increase like performance this. Well, there aren't too many people in a given area. Now this release of server meshing will come together with Pyro and will add a huge amount of new gameplay, polish, and will get them closer to what Chris directly references as beta, which is really impressive because this might be one of the first times I've actually heard him talk about beta for Star Citizen ever. But when you might be screaming at your screen at the- And this is why we typically don't let Chris Roberts talk. <laughs> point. When will you be able to test it? <laughs> when is, is it going to be in line? Talk, well, the timeline beta. is that they want to shoot for it to be in the test servers at the end of this the year. But it's going to start with Evo Cadi, and that's if things go well with the persistent entity streaming service that they're testing in 318. So if that doesn't go well, it'll likely get pushed to next year. But if everything goes perfect, then it might go to PTU, the public test universe, so we can have it in our hands before the holidays. But again, all of this depends on how well things go. Whatever happens though, they're still shooting for a quarter one 2023 release to the live environment for server meshing. But given that this is a very complex technology, don't be surprised if this gets pushed back. And if you've been following my channel for a while, you'll know that I've been talking about server meshing being pushed back to next year for a while now, so you shouldn't be that- Bro, and the people- dude, I see it on like Twitter and shit all the time now. Cause he made- he made that post um saying that you know like nothing tangible is coming this year and that is like honestly still remain true pretty much uh i think this was after 315 and people are like non-stop about it but you said nothing would come more like and that and like this stuff comes out the letter from the chairman comes out and everyone's like S look at morphologist now he said nothing would come and it's like we still don't technically have it like tangible is like you actually are playing it and even then like persistence and all these things are not like when they come in how how like functionally perfect are they going to be right like what morph means is that there's you're not going to be like tangibly playing a video game like it's not this year is not the year that star citizen is going to become the game that everybody wants it to be like i don't think there was like there was no negativity behind anything morph said in that video and everybody lost their mind because their architect reviews guy said something negative about their game it was so funny to me that surprise that they that lost it is in fact the case chris finishes off this letter thanking the studios thanking us as backers All for right, supporting so him in the project and I gotta say, Chris, thank you for having such an amazing vision. And I'm glad we're here today seeing that vision start to become reality. I think that this letter is one of the best letters I've ever seen by Chris Roberts. I am so excited for all the things he's talked about in here. And I'm very happy that he was so candid with us and so realistic about these timelines. I fully suspected that we would have a very long testing Thank cycle you, if we did crazy. any Appreciate testing it. this year with Thank persistence you, crazy, or server meshing, and I'm glad to see that they're thinking about how long this might take and planning around it. I'm not really that upset that they're pushing stuff back when it comes to something as important as persistence. If this goes well, the universe becomes possible. This, guys, is really the precipice. This is the edge. This is the cliff. This is the next step. 
I cannot really express fully here how important these technologies are for Star Citizen to become truly and undisputedly the best space game ever. However, I want to caution you guys against setting that hype train to full throttle. Because although this tech is important and- I think he's getting to it now. Because the hype train was full throttle from this point in the video until right now and is possibly going to be coming online this year with persistence and server meshing, the technology is just the first step. Getting the universe that we want with all its features is something that they still need to develop out. That is what these technologies enable. And so although we'll get this tech this year, the player experience won't change too much. We'll get more content, but the effects of it won't become apparent until later next year. Next year is likely no, to become the biggest the year ever for Star Citizen, and I will go so far as to say that it will be the year for Star Citizen. Guys, I've been Morphologist. I want to know what you guys think down below. Are you excited for what Chris is talking about here? Are you excited to test persistence and server meshing? And if you guys think that this is a really important technology and it's going to change the game in a big way, maybe you can explain down below how you think persistence is going to change the game for you when it's first released. Anyway. I've been Morphologist. I'll see you in the next one. Okay, so the thing that I really think that he is... I don't think he's ignoring it on purpose, but every everything about the persistence tech, the PES, and server meshing in the article, this was, I think, one of the very special things that happened this time, and that was different about this letter was that it wasn't all hype. Which was like kind of the opposite of Morph's video here. Is Morph's video did what Chris would normally do in his letter, is we're going to have thousands of players, and later next year, and as the tech comes online, all these things are going to happen. But in the letter, things were said like, um, but we really will not know with confidence until it hits testing. Like, we don't, like, this is not different than iCash. This could be iCash in a lot of ways is how I read that, is the they don't fully know how far this will push them, how many people they will be able to have, how uh, well the server tick rate will be, or how good it will be, or how fast it will be. And all the answers will happen they'll start to learn the answers or they'll start to create more questions or whatever once these things get into testing. And that is, I think, one of the key things out of the article that was not brought up by a lot of people is that a lot of the things that Chris said was, we hope that this is how it will work, but we don't know. And I thought that that was like one of the best parts of that statement was that his ability to not be so pie in the sky and be realistic about it. Like, I, I see a lot of comments about on my feelings about the article, about people going, oh, wow, you're so positive now. This all this uh, uh, like the reason that I'm more positive is because they are pulling back a little bit and they're going there, it's not all glitz and glare and it's going to be all this, you know, and, and that's what that's what feel, felt really good for me was that it was it was way more realistic in in the 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 way they explained it. Like, we hope that this is really going to be great, but we won't know until we get it in testing, which is just. Yeah, grounded. That's like a really good word for it. It's grounded. And and I love Morph, but he was in the Clouds of Crusader in in, in the article in the video. And that's that's where I I was I think he he stated what server meshing will be and what it could what it would do, not what it might do. Right? And that's that's the that's the part. And like somebody was like, you should be his manager or whatever. No, I'm just sharing my opinion about his video. Shut up, idiot in chat. So the that's like that was like the key thing from the article for me.
yeah, it's time to walk the walk. So Xylo's here and like even agreed with what I said. So I'm sure somebody's gonna make some dumbass comment saying that I'm that I I'm stupid or whatever. But that's like that's what that was my takeaway. My takeaway was not oh my god, server meshing is here. Oh my god, PES is here. Oh my god, whatever. It was wow. This was different. This was different. Now. I fully expect, like, this is one thing where I'm a little bit like, oh my god, excited. The PES thing was shown internally, and we've been around the project long enough that I feel like a lot of the internal, um, the internal playtest stuff does end up on the ISCs and, and, and things. Like, when they, when they show that stuff and it works, I think, like, Jared takes that and is like, oh, this is content for ISC then. So I fully expect to see that demo of PES at some point. I don't know what it would take and how long it would take for us to see it. But if it was shown internally, then it probably could be shown to us. That's pure speculation, objection, uh, hearsay. You know, you could say whatever you want with that. But that is the one like pie in the sky thing I took from this was that. I expect to see PES and not read about PES. So, yeah. Marketing folks wouldn't like me doing marketing. I don't care about money, only fun. Yeah, same. That's why I get so mad all the time. Because, <laughs> like, hey, I just, I just care about the game. I just want the game to be fun. But, yeah, so that's what I, I – that's the one, like, that's my expectation soon – is to see something like it, it, it working on, on a, a something that we would have seen before. I don't know how it was shown. Was it shown on, you know, in a way that we play the game? It was, you know, I don't know. But <laughs> so yeah, but that is uh, that's my take. I I I wanted to really hear what what Morph was excited about. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I agree with most things. I just think that, um, I think Morph has a lot of power in the community as far as content creation goes. And I think a lot of people take, like, look, they got mad, they got super mad when he said something negative and, um, I think he was less grounded than the uh, than the letter was, and that's all. Uh, otherwise, it was uh, it was really good. I thought it was really well edited, and I thought it was really well put together. So, yeah. Oh, it sounds like Morph's really excited to me, Daddy Cash. But yeah, so that was Morphologist on the letter. I thought it was really good. I just. The thing, like, that was the one thing that I pinpointed more than anything, but that's maybe my, like, my glass half-empty brain, so, yeah. <laughs>